very much. I'm, I'm not going to introduce him because you all know him. Well, <laughs> hopefully a few people are. And I can even, I even know people who are hidden behind the pillar at the moment, uh, Chris Jones uh, at the back. <laughs> Um, I hadn't appreciated I was coming to a, a committee scrutiny session there, Jane, having <laughs> <laughs> seen the interrogation from the left, so I'll have to be more prepared for next time. But um, Burada, Pauber, good morning. Very nice to see you all here. Um, forgive my notes. Um, I'm just at that kind of age uh, at the moment where uh, my very focals are having to kick in. So I know it's not always ideal, but uh, if you just forgive me uh, using these as well. Um, but I just wanted to start by thanking you for the opportunity to come and speak with you all today. As always, when I'm in the building, just a real privilege to talk to you. And I hope to give you a bit of an overview, uh, building on Jane's uh, reflections with you about the healthcare landscape in Wales. Um, I hope to outline the opportunities and the challenges, but we'll particularly make some specific remarks about the importance of our relationship between the Welsh Government and the life science sector in particular. And obviously, knowing the level of uh, close working going on with the pharmaceutical industry and colleagues as well. Um, Maybe if I can just give you some overview, because uh, there are some familiar faces here, I know you'll appreciate this, but um, just to say as Chief Executive of NHS Wales, um, I, I lead a system with 80,000 staff. Um, we spend nearly £7 billion. Uh, that will continue to increase with the draft budget announcements that have been made by Welsh Government over recent weeks. And I would just say at the start, it's an extraordinary financial commitment to services. Um, but actually, in my world, the NHS does and can spend this very easily. Um, People's demands and expectations of health and social care services simply continue to increase. And as you know, some of this is driven by our population demographics, but also um, for positive reasons, because of an improvement in life expectancy, which, of course, the NHS in part is responsible for with the interventions that have been possible over these recent years. And I think we should celebrate that, of course, but we do need to recognise that it comes with resource implications for those of us who are working in the system. And as everyone in the room will be very familiar with, uh, there are also growing opportunities for new clinical practice and the use of technology, uh, new drugs and interventions. And in this context, uh, Welsh ministers have prioritised funding for the NHS in Wales. So on the latest available figures from the UK Treasury, spending on health has been growing at a faster rate than any other UK country. And when spending on health and social care is combined, Wales is spending around 6% more than within the English system. And interestingly, I was in London yesterday just having some reflections with some of the other administrations on what are the implications for that in terms of our overall care system. Um, and this is happening at a time when the Welsh Government's budget has been static. And of course, there are pressures in other sectors, such as local government, which have a significant implication for the public purse. Now, this investment announced over the, the last few months has been critical, supporting prompt access to medicines in Wales. And I hope that you're aware that the Welsh Government has in its new programme for government taking Wales forward demonstrated its continued commitment to ensure access to effective and affordable medicines for citizens across Wales. So the ongoing independent review of the individual patient funding request or IPFR process in Wales, which is examining how individual funding decisions on treatments which are not routinely available are made in Wales, the UK and elsewhere, and the commitment to invest over 80 million over the life of this government in a new treatment fund, which is designed to help accelerate access to approved cost-effective treatments for patients with life-threatening illnesses. I hope are clear examples of the continued importance being placed on this area. And this, of course, is over and above the underlying annual medicine management spend, which for us in Wales represents about 10% of our overall budget. The new treatment fund is intended to promote the earlier introduction not only of the most innovative and high-cost medicines, which are recommended by NICE and the All, Mel, All Wales Medicine Strategy Group, but all medicines approved by those appraisal bodies. And I'm pleased that the ABPI welcomed this announcement. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and Sport will want to raise both the fund and the IPFR review when he addresses the conference later today, and will be giving some of the further details. Um, uh, in plenary and through ministerial statements uh, during December, but I'm sure he'll give you a few highlights uh, in advance. Um, but ongoing budget increases for the health and social care system at a rate that is above the change in the Welsh Government's overall budget cannot continue indefinitely. And we know that despite improvements in a number of key service performance measures, we still have poorer health outcomes on the back of social deprivation, and we still see extremes of variation in life expectancy and healthy years. A third of the Welsh population, as you know, still report um, life-limiting health conditions. So whilst I think our NHS model still uh, is envied by many other international systems, and I think it does um, stand up to scrutiny in this respect, not least after 68 years, 
In the context of the challenges that I've outlined, it's also an NHS that needs to continue to develop and aim for excellence and ensure that it doesn't stand still. So I hope that you were able to help us with that with some of your reflections through the course of today. So coming to your event, today's ABPI Cymru Annual Conference is entitled Together, Stronger, Joint Working in Wales. And it's heartening to see that message as the focal point for your discussions during the day. And I hope it represents the way I personally try to lead and act, but also um, leads to stimulating different thinking from the service and from the system. And to me, and in response to the challenges that I've just outlined, that statement frames the opportunity that I think we do have here in Wales about working alongside each other. Delivering on the benefits of our strong principles, our integrated structures, our close working relationships here in Wales, I don't think it's just some far off pipe dream. We already have a much less fragmented health system here in Wales compared to many other countries. And as many of you will know, that's because back in 2009, we put in place integrated health boards with a population health remit. And this means it's possible to put our arms around the whole system of healthcare from primary care through to our acute and specialist hospital services. Um, but there is something about the need to change services. And my own view is that these advantages help not hinder in the face of the challenges that we face. But I believe that there is so much more that we can do to take advantage of them. To seize these opportunities that are there for us, our service focus needs to shift and change. And we need to enable different discussions with our citizens, but also with those who are aligned with the NHS. And although there has been an inevitable focus on the role of our local hospitals and the development of specialist work and interventions, the greatest change ahead of us still remains our primary community and our social care infrastructure. We know it's been a strategic intent of our system over the course of the last decade, the last two decades indeed, but we're at a moment when we have to come good on the promises that we've made, not least to the Welsh population. And in terms of the 10-year vision for the service which we're developing, one of the distinctive features of the future NHS Wales should be its ability to show improvement and change in the area of population health and prevention. And we have our own research experience here in Wales which shows why we must act on this. So, for example, the Caerphilly cohort study tracked over many years showed us that eating more healthily, stopping smoking, drinking moderately and exercising more can add up to 10 healthy years to our lives. However, sometimes we just need to pause and ask ourselves why we don't always comply with the evidence. And that probably applies to ourselves in the room. I won't, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands by any means, but if I did a test to say how many of us are complying with those kind of five actions that we know make a difference to health, I sense that we probably wouldn't necessarily have a full set unless you are the fittest individuals that I've ever spoken to at any of these events before. Um, but my point is that despite knowing things that make a difference, we don't always translate that to the real world and we're perhaps not as evidence-based as we imagine in terms of our practice and maybe in terms of the implications for society. Um, and I'm also mindful that this public health agenda is, is more than just the NHS. Again, we know because of evidence that only 20% of this wellbeing agenda is influenced by the quality of care and services from the NHS. And I think it's really important that Wales focuses on the determinants of health and we need to ensure that we can provide the right support right throughout the life course. And yes, this means early years and the start to life, but also, of course, the progressive needs of people as they continue into older age and higher needs. And I think that we have the chance to provide a clear and distinctive public policy around public health and protection issues. So with this aim in mind, the Welsh Government has been able to use new lawmaking powers, starting with the Social Care Act, but also areas such as the Public Health Bill and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And the Public Health Bill, obviously currently under discussion, allows for a broader discussion about the determinants of health. The Wellbeing of Future Generations Act will change the course and setting we're on through its Healthier Wales statutory commitment. And that means a legal obligation to make sure that as public services, we all work together to the advantages of the Welsh population. And then there's prudent healthcare, uh, just come from a meeting and discussion with the Cabinet Secretary. And again, this is a, a core discussion he wants to have about applying the prudent healthcare lens to everything that we do, whether it's our strategic intents or whether it's the practical delivery of services. And, and this change agenda is where our Made in Wales approach to prudent healthcare comes in. And I'm glad to see that that is also a focus of today's conference. I think your own areas of interest are absolutely critical to make prudent healthcare work and contribute. Um, but it is a distinctly Welsh approach, which is intended to establish a more open relationship with patients and also to show practical actions that release resources to be directed to patient care and improve quality and avoid harm. It means focusing on what matters to patients 
not asking them what is the matter. And we have an opportunity with the Welsh population and our patients to co-produce our services and responses, and we need the Welsh population to actually be alongside us in these actions and expectations. And I think that this is absolutely consistent with our focus on quality. We have, over recent years, built on a system that openly addressed quality. We've handled this in a very public context, and we've highlighted progress and improvement. And it was reinforced recently by the highly regarded OECD, who stated that when they came into Wales, they felt that the quality commitment was very visible, right through from government to frontline staff. So again, there's something to step up to there, if that's the ambition and expectation that we are promoting to others who, who check in on the Welsh system. But prudent healthcare also demands a new relationship with industry. And here, the essential ingredient for partnerships between <coughs> NHS Wales and industry is matching clinical need with commercial expertise. And I want to see much closer relationships between suppliers and the NHS to develop and to deliver more effective co-produced products and services for Welsh patients. And in fact, I've been spending a lot of my own personal time ensuring that we're able to understand the different perspectives and see how we can focus on practical actions in this sphere, not least the facilitation of uh, commercial and ind industry frameworks. So two years on from the launch of the Prudent Healthcare Principles, I think there is some good progress being made but it's evident that prudent healthcare isn't a quick fix. It's an open-ended commitment to pursue great value that will require leadership and involvement at all levels and indeed across sectors and experience. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, performance and in painting a picture of you of what the future may hold for the NHS in Wales, I would also add that given the NHS spends nearly half of the Welsh Government budget, it should come as no surprise that the way the NHS operates now is under a very large spotlight. Um, perhaps a, a look at, in a rounded way at performance in Wales may just help a little bit here. And despite pressures, there are a number of our indicators across a balanced portfolio that are actually showing targets being met. I know that often doesn't break into the public arena, but there are many areas which are showing improvement. And a number of these are improvements in outcome areas that support a commitment to population health. Um, Maybe this isn't always picked up in that way, but it's absolutely clear that there are some high profile areas that we continue to need to improve, not least for good quality outcome and for patient experience. But you may not be aware uh, that our ambulance service, for example, has exceeded its target for nearly all of the last year. The latest uh, reported figures show pretty much close to 80% of its red calls for life-threatening calls responded to within eight minutes, not just across Wales, but above target in every health board area. And indeed, the ambulance service has improved so much in the last year that it is often now at the top of performance in the UK from what was a very difficult point. And I hope that would give us some confidence about our ability to, to look at underlying issues and actually hopefully support both services into the system into a better place. We've also, over this last 12 months, exceeded over 1 million accident and emergency attendances for the first time. And the, the median experience, so that means seen, treated and discharged, uh, perhaps in my other language, that means everybody done and dusted in terms of the, their needs for the health service system, is two hours, seven minutes. And on latest figures, nearly 85% all within four hours, despite these increases in volumes. But for me, the unscheduled care system is still the area that we absolutely need to focus on to give a consistent and more rounded performance for the future. Over the last year, we've seen more cancer patients treated and more treated within target than ever before. Um, over 50% more patients are being seen for cancer than five years ago, and our one-year and five-year cancer survival is at, at its highest level ever, with Wales improving at the fastest rate across the UK. But we need to use that as a foundation for further improvement and delivery in the future. And I think there are many areas of good day-to-day -day performance, service development and progress in quality that are in evidence across all of our services. But all of those must also be provided with care and dignity to those at their most vulnerable. So I think that we need a continuous commitment and vigilance to this focus on care and dignity in all that we do. And increasingly, the service needs to ensure that our actions take place in full view and under review by our boards. And I hope as a minimum in Wales that when there is a problem, we must always openly do something about it and make sure that we give assurance on actions in place. And I wanted to make some specific remarks about innovation, technology and industry and engagement and um, perhaps to emphasise that I don't think this is at all different from the experiences that I've just been outlining to you uh, in the first part of this presentation. Innovation has to be key to driving efficiency within NHS Wales and to prove outcomes for our patients. And despite the budget challenges that I've outlined, to me innovation is a necessity rather than a cost or a threat. 
And it's an area that I've personally highlighted as a priority for us in these challenging times. I think it's a, an area where hopefully we can put a skip in our step about our ability to reinforce change within our overall system. And in my role, what interests me in terms of um, what interests me is what constitutes um, best in class, which is driven by a focus on what the Welsh population needs. And this means that we have to, uh, in a relentless manner, seek good practice and innovation wherever it exists. That means nationally in Wales, it means more broadly in the UK, internationally or indeed across other industries. And certainly in terms of some of the recent contacts that I've had with industry, I probably gained as much out of that experience personally in terms of the learning that I've needed to make in my oversight role for the system. But importantly, it means a continuous improvement approach, a focus and a commitment to individual patient experience. So I think that we have an immense depth of ex expertise and experience within our health and care system, which can generate new insights, ideas and invention. And I'm very proud that in Wales, we have a number of services which stand out on a UK basis like our All Wales Lymphedema Service, or our All Wales Approach to Diabetic Retinopathy, or the Burns and Plastic Service at Morriston, which provides a regional service outside of Wales also, um, our Welsh Wound Centre at Llantrisant, or our international reputation for dementia and cancer research, or even throwing into that um, the recent legislation that was passed on consent and organ donation, which put a different spotlight on Wales, positively so. The Welsh Government's commitment to innovation, technology and industry engagement is exemplified through the Efficiency Through Technology programme in which we're investing £10 million a year. And I'm encouraged by the progress and achievements to date and the positive feedback that I have received around our innovation platforms, in industry partnerships and technology development and adoption projects. And the Welsh Government is clear that our relationship with the life sciences industry is and must remain strong. Your industry contributes significantly to the Welsh economy, as well as bringing life-saving and life-enhancing medicines to patients. Um, and I've personally tried to ensure, alongside ministers, that we've been able to bring the NHS closer to those types of relationships, when actually it's probably been difficult sometimes to, to find the doorway by which you engage with the NHS on a routine basis. So let me just give you some examples of our joint working successes. So currently the Welsh Government working through Health and Care Research Wales works closely with partners in the pharmaceutical industry to ensure that we're providing the right environment and services to make Wales an attractive location for conducting trials. Health and Care Research offers a number of services to pharmaceutical companies looking to conduct research in Wales, including feasibility coordination, study setup, through to assistance with delivery to time and target. Our NHS research and development funding policy allows revenue accrued from commercial trials to be used strategically to build a stronger research workforce in Wales, therefore providing an effective and responsive service to deliver studies that are sponsored by pharmaceutical industries. And I'm sure you'll have some other reflections on actions that you would like Welsh Government to get alongside very seriously that would continue to build on those good practices that we see already within our system. So um, to conclude, um, um, I had to press a button at a conference yesterday in London uh, and you had to score yourself on where you stood from my cup runneth over to being half full through to the world is dreadful. Um, hopefully those of you who know me know that um, I'm generally an optimist. I hope with, uh, with realism in that in terms of the expectations for our system. But um, the demands and pressures placed uh, on our services and system in Wales requires us to think differently and look for change. And I think if we continue to do that within our own NHS silo, we aren't going to get to outcomes that really would make these genuine differences to the population of Wales. How our services should develop over the next year will be the focus of a parliamentary review into the long-term future of health and social services. And after that review has reached its conclusions, the Cabinet Secretary for Health will respond through publishing a new, refreshed 10-year strategy for the NHS in Wales. And that will be later in 2017, just to be aligned with the findings of the parliamentary review. But I'm also optimistic about the future because by again reflecting the theme of this conference, we have a natural default in Wales to working together and within our communities. But I think it must be vested in expectations for improvement and not just words. And I would really appreciate people continuing to work in the forum as you are doing today to make sure that we do that on behalf of our services in Wales. And I hope that that reflects a positive reflection of our approach. I wish to do the best for our population, but also to do this together. And I hope that aligns with your conference uh, intentions. So 
As always, uh, with these reflections, I'm really interested to hear the outcomes of your conference. I hope that they will get shared with me through your own mechanisms so we can draw them in naturally to some of our current strategic reflections. And I'm always happy to have some practical products to get alongside as necessary that shows actually that we're prepared to do this together. So um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak this morning. Do appreciate it and uh, have a good day together. Jochen Yao. thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know you have to rush off, but one or two... Uh, yes, it's a scrutiny session now, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, you mentioned the, 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 there are centres of excellence in Wales, and the Wound Centre is one that comes to mind. I've worked with them. Um, Michael Owen's group here in neurology. It's a real world-class facility. Um, and uh, I personally think there should be a respiratory centre in Wales, because I think that's a, you know, it's a disease of Wales. And I'm sure that Swansea or some, somewhere could pick that up. But the, to my mind, as being a bit of a man from Mars, because I work in London, um, th there's not so much joined up thinking here. Um, you know, uh, I, I mentioned earlier I'm chairman of a company in Merthyr Tidville, Simbeck, Orion, and trying to work with Cardiff and Swansea and others, it's, it's not easy. And I just wonder, it's maybe not been your brief particularly, but how we could best share the talent and that the taxpayers invested in as well uh, to the better good of both research and therefore the community and the NHS. Well, look, I think that um, sometimes we're not taking advantages of structures that we have in place. You know, I feel very fortunate in Wales that in, in terms of knowing, you know, other people working in public services, whether it's in the education sector or myself, you know, I, 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 I will bump into them, I will see them, I won't be introduced perhaps for the first occasion on, on these times. Uh, certainly there's an advantage in Welsh Government in the way that we work, That uh, although please don't ask me questions on this, but um, in theory, sitting around the table in a more intimate manner with my colleagues, the Deputy Permanent Secretaries, the Permanent Secretary himself, and of course with politicians, you know, I, I do know what's going on with uh, the Metro or where we are at the stage in terms of um, the way forward around education, uh, the higher education sector, rather than just my NHS kind of brief. Um, but I go back to what I said is that maybe we don't take um, advantage of that fully. But these things don't come without risk. Uh, and the bit that I would really be emphasising at this stage is that we go into some of these relationships knowing that perhaps um, many of these will work and will come to a successful outcome. But actually some of them may not and we should allow ourselves to have a, a risk appetite for these different mm -hmm. areas. And it was fascinating uh, because I was an individual that was involved in the Welsh Wound Initiative when we tried to pull that together. We ended up with an outcome which was Welsh Government alongside the NHS, uh, alongside the education sector and alongside a kind of commercial and industry perspective. And I don't think we'd ever quite put all of those components together and shaken them together in the same tin. Right. Um, but um, it would have been easy to have walked away from establishing that initiative with a number of the obstacles that we were probably creating for ourselves out of the system that we had in the place to make sure that the governance was lined up in the right way. So I guess in response to you, it's not just to build up the relationship, it's to accept that you've actually got to go in the, with your eyes open on managing some of this risk at the same time. Yeah. And the joy for industry, of course, that when those centres are there, I mean, it's great to actually do the research there that leads on to, to other treatments, so that's good. Um, questions? On the floor. Comments. I can see a hand up at the back from a doctor. Oh, there we are. Dr. Chris Jones. Uh, Chris. <laughs> Involving the patient in choice. And that choice will affect, I'm absolutely certain, some of the targets. Because what is evidence in one disease perhaps doesn't fit with your life. And I think that we have to become a little bit more sophisticated. So at the minute, we've got two campaigns going in, in, on in Wales choose well and choose wisely. Personally, I don't think you can choose well if you're not choosing wisely. wisely. And it's the health literacy of the clinician with the patient. 
I don't believe that we are in any way in a fit state to open up that debate because many people are scared to move away from the guidelines. Well, it, that's exactly where the prudent principles from Bevan come in. I mean, I'll give you the one example. I think Andrew's heard it before. We interviewed a, a lovely family whose mum had just died. She was late 90s. And we said, what did you think? And they said it was fantastic. The nurses couldn't have been kinder. They said we were surprised there was those quality of doctors in Wales as well. They were brilliant. And, you know, she had all the latest tests and scans. She was ferried to hospital, and then they did all the procedures. So we said, so tick. They said, no. You know, honestly, we... If you'd have talked with her and us a year ago, we probably wouldn't have wanted to do half of that, and she'd have had a better quality of life. You'd have saved a lot of money or freed resources. And it's that dialogue that you mentioned between the patient, the carer, the practicing physician that actually becomes, you know, only do what you must do, not just get prescriptive when you get a diagnosis. And it's absolutely cool as reflected on the uh, prudent healthcare principles and what we need to do. Um, and I guess if I was looking for Wales to be distinctive, it's for us to understand that those are difficult discussions. But um, intervention isn't just a technical process. It's uh, individual focused and it's about um, having a holistic um, level of discussion with people. I think we need to uh, reinforce that level of discussion you know, with clinical teams and for them to understand that the system is expecting some of that. Because equally that can be very difficult, I know, for clinicians. Um, to have that face-to-face -face discussion in that manner. But I, I hope that's something and that Wales can be... And it takes time and you're in a busy surgery. Well, so, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, well, Rick, do you want to come in? And I think it's a great question, Chris. And, and, and to be honest, I think, I, well, I hope then that the, the, the case studies that we've been looking at for, for the rest of the day will, will actually bring to the fore the importance of that dialogue, that the importance of, of co-production, and the importance of, of using the right medicine at the right time for the right patient. Yeah, it's it's all oh, fundamentally the, the it's same the picture. Of the oh, oh yeah. yep, absolutely. It's yeah. the holistic view. Yeah. 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 Those spaces are usually on individual yeah. drugs, yeah. and it's this crossover of multiple polypharmacy that causes the potential for great harm as well as the indeed. Benefit. Well, we'll come back to that as we get through to the day. Uh, just briefly, you mentioned this um, new treatment fund, and that is a super uh, way forward. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in England, they announced this accelerated access fund, which was trumpeted. Sir John Bell and I did an interview together, and it says, well, we're going to really make, you know, I'm announcing today that we're going to make more products available. Actually, it's like five advances a year, and mostly non-pharmaceuticals. And I'm saying, wait a minute, you know, we've got to find a way of, the right medicines at the right place at the right time, which I think your fund does. Yeah, and, and also uh, to say a couple of things, you know, to remember that although there's a focus on that additional money coming into the system, is to, to remember that we, of course, have existing commitments within our uh, existing city. You know, there are budgets within health boards that allow some of this spend. But, but absolutely what we were trying to convey uh, with our approach in Wales was uh, the danger is it becomes a discussion about cancer almost singularly. But certainly what yeah. we wanted to aspire to was this is about having a fund that's available to the treatment of all conditions, and that philosophy has been really important to retain. Before, I, before we disappear, one other thing. Um, Jane mentioned about the, the structure of the health uh, service in Wales being, I think the word she used was... Uh, she wasn't not configured, was she? No, not configured optimally. When I come down here, which is frequently, um, I realise that sort of you've got seven kind of health authorities, and yet the population's the size of Manchester, and all these seem to be working inde independently. And hence what we're doing at Bevan on December the 7th for these exemplars to bring everybody together to say, can't you share some of this knowledge? But isn't there a need to rethink the structure of how health is delivered? I mean, in England, we've got commissioning groups not talking to CCGs and so on. That needs a whole sort of rethink. Well, again, a bit of context, really. So I spent yesterday um, speaking at an event around devolution and having some reflections, which were both uh, with English colleagues as well as from Scotland, and there was myself from Wales. Um, interestingly, one of the outcomes was a view that um, the STP approach um, could probably learn quite a lot from Scotland and Wales about what we've tried to do in some of the enabling structures that have been put in place. Um, and it, it, it's rather salutary, and I've been one myself when you were a health board chief executive, because in a system that we have had in the past, where um, you've had organisations wanting to um, pass over accountability to others, yeah, or yeah, that's what yeah. commissioners are doing, it's yeah. only that other organisation hasn't dealt with it. You're looking in the mirror and recognising that you've got your own responsibility to well, make sure the changes the kind of happen. Well, you've got the in Wales, haven't you? Indeed, yes, absolutely. Um, but also we, we do 
require the health boards to have some sovereign responsibility for decisions on behalf of their health boards. And we do want them to make sure that they knit together nationally, of course, when necessary, but actually they do have a responsibility but to discharge their communities. they have to be like a board of directors, responsible and accountable for the whole of Wales and their own individual pitch? They can't just say, it's not my problem. C current directions that are given anyway in our system means that they have to respond to the Welsh position as well as for okay. their local communities. Um, whether that is explicit enough or understood enough is a different area, but I can be very clear that the Cabinet Secretary, and he may reflect on this uh, later uh, as he joins you, um, it certainly has a view that he wants to see much more regional planning. Yeah. I think the thing that we have to recognise in Wales is there is an NHS Wales identity inevitably, but NHS Wales isn't an organisation. You know, it is created through 10 organisations that kind of feed in. But actually, if you look at all of the discussions that happen in plenary, there's a level of detail of questioning that is happening for both the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary that shows that Wales is a small place. You can put your hands on a three million population. So I want to have strong local organisations contributing nationally, batting on behalf of their local communities, but I also want to have a strong national identity yes. that may ultimately lead to intervention where necessary and some very clear expectations coming through that national lens. Indeed. So thank you very much for your invitation to for industry to say what else could you do for us and could we work together. We'll pick that up as the day goes on and we'll certainly feed back. Thank you for your time with us. Uh, not at all and I'll nominate you for the Public Accounts Committee membership. <laughs> <laughs>